Hey, Meg, can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you. All right. And Jelko here as well. Hi. And Eric's over there. Where's the camera? Oh, there it is. So we currently have um, about 17 people, so we might just want to give it a minute or two. Sounds good. Um, maybe, I guess, for some of us, we don't we know the names, but maybe we don't actually know what you do. Um, so maybe while we have a minute or two, I guess, for the people who are in the room, all right, what, what's your role for us? Because um, you're, you're the LSST sort of, you're managing all of data management, right? Yeah, so I'm the um, data management subsystem scientist. So I'm I'm responsible for I'm essentially responsible that the LSST data management system produces the data products that the science community needs to get the science done. Um, so in the context of the solar system, that's part of my responsibilities. But um, and I'll say a little bit that a little bit maybe a little bit more about that in the talk. But uh, specifically for the solar system, I'll I'll be um, taking up a more active role there um, uh, to to be the liaison to the to the solar system science collaboration um, and to help define all the data products um, as as well. So I'm basically the one who needs to ensure that what we put out is useful to get the science done. Great. Um, for the other people that just joined, if you can mute yourself, that would be great. Um, we're going to take questions through the chat window and that'll make it easier to feed any questions to, to Mario or anyone else um, from the project team. So I think if we just give it one more minute, um, I think you can get started. So let's just give it till 32. Sounds good. And we're recorded. So hopefully this is somewhere in the in the cloud. We're waiting. Let's see if we can position this camera a bit better. Yeah. Still me. <laughs> <laughs> While we're waiting, um, these slides should be accessible on, on the link above. So ls.st slash AAK. And that's a link to, to my Dropbox where, uh, where these slides are. And I'll, I'll make sure to put them as, as PDF somewhere as, as well after we're, we're done. Great, thanks. Yep. So I think we're going to call it a quorum. Um, so just a reminder for a couple of people who I just saw join, please mute if you're not muted. Um, if you've got a question, just go <laughs> away very rapidly into the chat window and we'll go through them in order. Um, so I think with that, we've got a good enough quorum of 20 23 people on, then I think we can go. And we are recording, so hopefully we'll get a copy of this um, to send out. So I'll, I'll let you take it away, Mario. Thanks very much for giving us thanks. an update on MOPS. Yeah, th thanks, Megan, and thank you for organizing this. Um, this has been by far the, the best advertised talk uh, in in any of the LSSD collaborations I've ever, ever, been, at, I've ever been at. And I think the, the number of people that have joined um, is, is a testament to that. So well, well done. Um, all right, so who am I? I'm, uh, my name is Mario Yurich. Um, I'm uh, at the University of Washington. I'm the LSSD data management subsystem scientist. So as, as we chatted a few minutes ago, 
um, I'm responsible for for making sure that the, the data products that VM puts out um, are are what the scientists need, what, what the community needs to, to actually do science analysis T. So this talk is going to be, um, it's a bit of a mix. We, we started with, uh, or I started thinking about uh, just giving you an update of, on MOPS, but I think based on your questions, I broadened it a little bit. Um, so I, I called it MOPS status, the science and your questions. Um, one of the things that I want to emphasize here is that you know, I'm, I'm giving the talk, but the, the, the real heroes are, um, or some of the real heroes are here on the screen. So Lynn Jones, who's done a, a, a lot of uh, research and has led the, the paper on NEO, um, on LCTs, NEO discovery efficiency. Joachim Moens, uh, who's a graduate student here at uh, UW, who will be working on a lot of the, the MOPS um, development over the next couple of years. Um, Colin Slater, who uh, is pictured here wearing a hard hat, and he's on vacation, so I couldn't ask him why his official photo has, has him wearing a hard hat. Um, but he's one of our um, LSST uh, data management science postdocs, and Eric Belm, uh, who's here with us uh, in, in the room, who's the overall lead for uh, the level one effort at UW, uh, which includes um, uh, the solar system, solar system science aspects as well. Um, so. Whenever you see any one of these folks as well, uh, either next week at the All Hands meeting or, or anywhere, they're also good people to talk to about solar system uh, science status, uh, but what we're planning with NDM, uh, et cetera. So I thought I would start by um, just briefly giving you a sense of where we are with LSST. Uh, this is a slide that, that I've been showing for the past, um, oh, it's been at least half a decade now, what LSST is. So it's an eight meter class telescope. Uh, we're going to image about 80,000 square degrees uniformly. Uh, more than that, uh, if you take into account the Northern Eclipse per uh, 10 million second astrometry, uh, single image uh, limiting depth of uh, 24.5, going up to 27.5 at 10 years, six bands, precise astrometry, a large camera and the tagline being imaging the visible sky once every three days for 10 years. So we started construction in uh, 2014. <coughs> this has been the state of the site uh, on April 14, 2015, when the first stone was laid. And this is what the summit looks like essentially today. So this photo has been taken, I think, uh, five days ago um, or six days ago on August 3rd. And you can see that the LSST is taking shape. Uh, the reason why this photo was taken is, was because this was the moment when the dome was placed on the calibration telescope, which you see here on the left. Uh, this is a small telescope on the left, a small, you know, only, only meter. Um, and what's amazing to me is that, you know, after decades of, of R&D and preparation, what you see on the summit today is actually fairly close to what we'll have um, essentially a year from now. So a year from now, uh, the, the observatory building is going to be built. We'll be putting in the telescope. Uh, we'll be getting ready to put the mirror in and preparing for commissioning in late 2019, uh, early 2020. So the, the project is, uh, is doing well. It's on track. Uh, there are things that are being built. There, there are buildings that are being built on, on the summit. Uh, there, uh, the part that I didn't show, uh, is all the progress with the cameras and with the sensors that, that we have coming in. Um, and then what we're starting to focus now, or I mean, what we're focusing on now as well, in addition to those two aspects, is data management and uh, making sure that the software is ready uh, in time for start of commissioning, which, as I said, is uh, only about two years uh, away from today. So... That's all. What I was, that's all I was going to say about uh, the, the status of, of LSST is more of a pictorial idea to 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 give you a sense that there, this is not an imaginary telescope anymore. Things are really getting built at the summit, and now I'm going to go and uh, discuss these three elements. And I hope there'll be um, a lot of time left for discussion. Uh, but let's let's go through this and we'll see. So, you know, I'll, I'll start with the, the status and plans for MOPS. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about MOPS itself uh, and describe what is it that we're going to do and, and how uh, for, for the folks who may not be as familiar with the algorithm. Now, I'll talk about science expectations, 
what is it that we expect LSST is going to deliver for asteroid science? And then um, the, one of the things that, that Meg prepared that, and that, that you all participated in that have made it uh, much easier for me to prepare this presentation was that list of questions. So I actually took some time to transfer them to slides and to try to answer, uh, try to answer uh, as, as many as I could. Um, so, so hopefully um, that uh, this last section will, will answer some of the questions that you had uh, for, uh, for additional discussion. So let's uh, let's talk about MOPS first. Um, the the way LSST is going to discover asteroids, or what counts in LSST as a reportable discovery, is when we capture at least three pairs of observations of the same asteroids over three nights in a in a short period. And by short, we our baseline right now is two weeks. And when we capture those three observations, <laughs> if those observations fit a Keplerian orbit, heliocentric Keplerian orbit, we count that as a reportable discovery and, and count it as, um, as an object that we can actually uh, put into our catalog and send uh, to the, and report to the Minor Planet Center. So to introduce some terminology here, um, as I'm showing, I'm not sure if you see, uh, can you just confirm if you see my, uh, my pointer? Yeah, we can see it. All right. So here is an <coughs> here is an, is an example of that. So let's say we have two observations in night one. Um, we may have uh, two pairs of observations, so four observations in night two, and we may have another observation in night three. And as I said, as I said, these nights don't have to be consecutive. They only have to fit in um, on order of two-week period. So these two observations in night one, uh, when we link them, we call these a tracklet. So these are potential linkages in the same night. We do that kind of linking in every night. Once those, those tracklets are established, what we can do is we can then, we then attempt to link them together from night to night. When this link succeeds, that's what's called a track. Um, once we have a track established for, uh, for a series of observations, I said at least three pairs taken over three nights, um, we perform initial and differential orbit determination. If that passes, especially if the IOD passes, we think this is a good enough match, a good enough link that we um, publish it and report it to the MPC. And what I'm showing you here is, uh, is nothing um, extraordinarily new. This is the well-known MOPS algorithm that was you know, written about in, in the mid 2000s by um, Deneau, uh, Jedeke et al, um, and uh, uh, Kubica et al for, for his thesis. Or, Jeremy Kubica for his thesis. What MOPS is, uh, MOPS stands for Moving Object uh, Processing System. And what MOPS is, is the piece of software that does all of this, that takes observations from different nights, connects them into tracklets, connects tracklets into tracks, um, and then runs initial and differential orbit determination. That's how we define it. For this to work, Obviously, you have to have uh, two closely separated observations in, in every night. So LSST's observing strategy is, um, is, is, is tuned to, to give us that. Um, our observing strategy is such that we get two observations, so two visits, uh, within about 30 minutes. So this here is an actual distribution of visits in one of the realizations of our observing strategy, and you can see that uh, the, the peak of this histogram is, is actually slightly lower than 30 minutes. So this is, this is about 20 minutes in, in this case. But roughly it's between 20 and, th and 40 minutes where we, are, where we try to get this peak. Each observation itself is actually split into uh, two 15-second exposures, uh, which allows us to do some additional um, nice things, such as if we have a trailed object, um, this gives us the opportunity to, to establish the direction of motion of that, of that object. But for MOPS, we largely consider these uh, two times 15 second exposures as one 30 second exposure. And then we have two of those effective 30 second exposures separated by 30 minutes. And then the scheduler has been tuned so that roughly three days later, it comes back to the same field and does the same sequence. So. Uh, again, a, a 30 second combined exposure, 30 minutes later, come back to another 30 second exposure. And that gives you the sort of thing that you need to do to do this matching. Um, 
why is this so when you when one this when one plots it this way um this seems like a fairly easy thing to do right i have i have my my tracklets uh from night to night i draw a line through them um i discover an asteroid it's easy why isn't it easy well it isn't easy because there is not just one asteroid in the sky there are millions so with lssd we expect about a million tracklets per night and you don't know um, which asteroid is which or which track with matches to which asteroid in general. So there are a couple of potential problems here, right? If the density of detections, <coughs> if say the density of the asteroid in the sky is high um, relative to, um, if the density of the asteroids in the sky is high, then there could be multiple potential um, observations that that you can use to form tracklets. So this here is depicted. I, I, I stole this um, uh, figure from uh, Dino et al. Uh, from uh, 2006 ADAS. This figure shows you that kind of problem. So if I have in my first observation, if I if I have this object, and in my second observation around that object, I see three others that are all within plausible uh, that are all within the plausible distance then I have three potential linkages there, and I have to take all those um, into account. Now, what happens here is um, typically with, the, with what we've chosen for LSST, or with the cadence that we've chosen for LSST, um, if the only thing we had on the sky were asteroids, this wouldn't be that much of a problem. So the density of asteroids is sufficiently low that we don't have many mismatches. Uh, we do have some, but uh, it's not dominant. What the problem really is, is that our software, uh, our image differencing techniques are not perfect. So occasionally you will get not only real asteroids, real objects um, in, uh, as, as, as potential candidates to link to, but you will also get false positives that uh, come due to um, things like ghosts or, or artifacts in the camera um, or artifacts with image differencing itself. And it's actually those, those false positives are the ones that dominate uh, the, the density of potential candidates in the sky. And if you have too many false positives, um, those can then generate many, many tracklets uh, for every uh, real asteroid, for every real observation. Now, if you're generating, if you have a case like, like the one that I'm showing here, where for each asteroid you're generating three potential tracklets, then now you have to try to connect every one of those three to the next observation taken three nights away. So you have a cascade where you're now, you are having to, to, to try to connect um, uh, multiple plausible tracks when linking them night to night. So you have three here, then next night you're going to have another three, then it's three times three to link to the next night, et cetera. <coughs> so the issue is that you can potentially end up in this in this fairly serious cascade of generating many many objects or many many plausible tracks that you cannot uh, exclude um, all the way until you get to orbit determination. Once you try to do orbit determination of, on each one of those tracks, you actually typically can reject those false linkages, but that costs time. So what one wants to do is not to have to go all the way to orbit termination to start rejecting those tracks, but um, reduce the number of false positives and reduce the number of tracks, of plausible tracks that have to go all the way to here. And in absolutely the worst possible scenario, if the density of detections is exceptionally high, and by detections here I mean uh, both false positives and uh, actual asteroids, then not even orbit determination may be able to reject them all. Uh, and this, this is something that we haven't actually observed in analysis T, but it, it is possible to, to happen, especially when you have correlated, um, uh, correlated false positives. So then you need more observations um, to confirm identification. Uh, three or not, three over three nights would not be enough. Um, you may need to have either a third observation in each tracklet, or even four observations per tracklet, or more nights. So I kept mentioning false positives, and there's a good reason for that. False positives here are really the key challenge. If the asteroids are distributed as they are in this figure from, uh, from Larry, um, then we wouldn't have much of a problem. The reality is when you lay 
um, a factor of five more false positive on, on top of that, then you start getting this kind of a cascade. Um, and with PANSTARS, uh, this was a major issue. PANSTARS uh, had false positive rates that in, in worst cases went all the way up to 50 to one. So for each uh, real object, there were 50 false positives. So you can imagine that creating uh, these cascading effects and essentially um, taking up all of your compute time, um, processing false positive, uh, potential false positive, tr potential tracks caused by false positives instead of processing real tracks. So what we've spent a lot of time on uh, with MOPS over the last um, couple of years, actually not with MOPS, with, with LSST over the last couple of years, is trying to address that issue. Can we do better with false positives? Understand where where things uh, haven't gone well before and understand how we can reduce uh, our false positive uh, rates because that is really going to be the key for to make MOPS work. Um, we're not the only ones that, uh, that, that have this problem with false positives. Uh, and when I say we, I mean the asteroid community. Um, this is actually something that's been, uh, that's been a, a, large, a big problem in the transient community. So folks who care about discovering supernovae or, or very strange explosive events. So Eric Belm, who's our, um, who's our lead uh, for level one, has actually been the project scientist at ZTF and has worked a lot on PTF. And PTF had rates of false positives um, on, on order of 100 to 1 before um, filters uh, for machine learning uh, filters were, were applied to, to reduce them down. So there have uh, there are similar stories uh, on the side of, of um, uh, in, in other experiments, in other cosmology experiments, such as uh, the dark energy survey. So there's been a lot of research here, uh, both within LSSD, within um, the solar system community, um, and even the transient community. And there are what what came out of all of that are. Um, essentially two places where improvements have been made. One are significant improvements to the hardware. So one of the things that I think Panstars has been has been really unlucky with is, is the camera. Uh, I, I was actually a postdoc um, um, back at the time when Panstars was on this guy. I worked on Panstars uh, when, when I was a postdoc. And Panstars camera had uh, was experimental and had these um, quite unfortunate artifacts that kept popping up and got misidentified as, as objects. In the meantime, um, the cameras that have been built since uh, have typically, uh, typically came with, with CCDs that have significantly fewer artifacts. So one example is DECAM. The reason why I'm, um, why I'm uh, bringing up DECAM here is that it's very comparable actually to the LSST camera in um, many of its, its properties. I'll show it to you in the next slide. So we have cameras now that have significantly fewer artifacts. And the, the second aspect here is that the optical system analysis T has been designed to minimize ghosting and internal reflections so as to, to minimize um, false positives coming from those. The other area of research um, here has been in, in software. Um, most false positives, I think, on, on, on uh, experiments like PTF and ZTF uh, are actually coming from artifacts uh, due to uh, imperfect image differencing. And there's been a lot of work on improving theoretical understanding, really, of the algorithms for image differencing um, and improvement of the software themselves, the image differencing pipelines, to, to the point where the pipelines are now um, yielding um, on order of, you know, in the case of DES, uh, 10 to 1 false positives ratio that is before any kinds of cleanup, um, and in the case of LSST, even lower than that. So with all these advances, uh, we believe that false positives have been reduced to manageable levels, uh, and that's been one of the key things for, for MOPS to, to work. So just to show you this, um, here's a nice uh, photo of the, the Blanco um, telescope and uh, the DE cam um, on, uh, in its focus. Um, this is a, one of the, the images, one of the full focal planes from the Dark Energy Survey uh, that's imaging about 5,000 square degrees of the Saturn sky. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because they have done a lot of work on improved image differencing pipelines um, and have been able to show that they can get these false positive rates uh, down to about 13 to 1, uh, just raw detections. And after filtering with uh, um, machine learning, uh, they get them down to one to three. So 
for every for three real objects, uh, you would get one false positive, one false positive, which is a lot different than uh, that one we, what we've been seeing uh, historically. So this is already with an acceptable uh, range for analysis T. Now, wh why the difference? Uh, or can you further visualize the difference between, say, what we had on? The, the, if you take a look at, at actually the, the the kinds of false positives that, that they have, you you notice the qualitative difference between the two. Um, so the ones that are, that remain on on uh, on Beckham are mostly things like cosmic rays. Uh, then there's some bad subtractions, uh, well, mostly cosmic rays and bad subtractions. So this tests to the improvements that were done uh, both to the CCDs, the reader electronics and optical systems uh, since, since these first generation experiments. So for LSST, this already gave us confidence um, or uh, this experience from, from Beckham gave us confidence that uh, it will be fine <coughs> or that our false positive rates are going to be well within the, the, the limits that we need for MOPS to work. But we did do our own study with the prototypes uh, of the software that we have, um, also using DECM data. Uh, and there's going to be more work with uh, with uh, AJC data going forward as well, and then uh, uh, actual LCC data two years from now. Uh, but the the paper summarizing um, that study is uh, actually in review in Icarus and Lynn Jones uh, led it. So this paper is focused on NEOs. But it talks a lot about MOPS, about um, image differencing efficiency, about the expectations, and all those expectations are valid across uh, all uh, solar system object populations. So I think this is going to be an excellent resource for, for everyone to understand what is it we're doing, um, and especially why, uh, how have we solved our um, some of our instrumental problems. Um, so I, I don't believe we have this on archive yet. Um, we will as soon as uh, we, we send the reply back to, to Icarus. And I think uh, I think Flynn's working on, on getting that done um, in the next couple of uh, days to two weeks. Um, so what is the, the summary that you will find in, in that paper? Well, what we did was we tested the performance of existing prototype LSSD pipelines. So we took the image differencing pipelines uh, as they exist today. We still have about five years of development scheduled for them, but uh, nevertheless, we try to be conservative and we took what we have today. And then we ran them <coughs> on, um, on DECAM, ran them on DECAM data. Uh, the other thing we did was we, we took MOPS, uh, the prototype that we have today, although we have a couple, we have was it, three, Three and a half years of, of, of really active development ahead of us for MOPS as well. And we tested that on simulations that were informed by the differencing tests. So, what we find is in the image differencing part that if we use fairly conservative worst case assumption, we get about 450 detections that includes false positives and real objects per square degree at five sigma for LSST. So, that's 450 intensities, 450 detections per square degree. Um, we expect for LSST to find about a thousand detections per square, per square degree of real objects. So what this is telling you that <coughs> with the code that we have today, we're expecting that our false positive rates are going to be on order of one to one or likely less than one to one. That is without um, image differencing afterburners. This also assumes no improvement to the existing pipelines, although uh, we, we will be doing a lot, especially to, to deal with some things that are unique with, with LSST, such as uh, differencing in different air masses. This number includes the expected 60 uh, false positives per square degree that are just due to Gaussian noise. So this 450 is, uh, 60 of the 450 are explained, uh, just if you look at the, the statistics of, uh, of Gaussian random fields. And it's likely that um, the, the 450 that we empirically find include real astrophysical sources. Um, and judging by their signal to noise distribution may even be dominated by them. Um, so we didn't have the right data to tell whether, uh, or uh, the, we didn't have the, quite the right data set to tell which ones are transient and which ones are, are not, or, or asteroids. Uh, but it's quite plausible that, that, that some large fraction of the 450 uh, is actually real. And another thing I want to emphasize is that we that we find uh, that we haven't applied any machine learning afterburns to this. So this is 
this is raw. Uh, these are raw counts that come out of image differencing. The, this is an extremely good result. Um, and uh, again, this is, these are real pipelines, uh, existing pipelines uh, run on real data. Um, so, so we try to, to, keep it, uh, to keep it reasonably realistic. The, the other thing that we, we checked is whether there uh, are any correlated false positives. So false positives that, that occur right next to each other um, on, on image to image. Those can, can create very tricky uh, traplet mislinkages. And we looked at the density of those, and those can happen, for example, on uh, diffraction spikes of stars. If the image difference is masking around uh, the diffractive around saturated stars isn't quite uh, quite optimal. So we looked at the density of those. We find that it's only on order of, uh, of two per square degree. I think the right the number is two point three or two point four per square degree for for the data set we looked at. So those are negligible. Uh, that's that's what uh, that's what uh, I guess the third bullet point that ended up um, um, incomplete was uh, was meant to say. Um, so that's good. So what we're seeing here is with the current prototypes, we're seeing another um, 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 leap relative to what uh, DES uh, did with their image differencing pipelines for for LSST, and it's all going in the right direction. Um, and we expect again the LST camera when that becomes when that data, those data become available to to be even better than uh, than what we get from DES. Now under those assumptions we can go and test MOPS. So we did that. <coughs> we have a prototype MOPS a prototype of MOPS that uh, that we developed back in I think 2013. Uh, we've tested whether it can do the the, the linkages with. Uh, 500 squared, 500 uh, false positives per square degree, and the answer is yes. And then we did another interesting thing, or I shouldn't say we, it's, it's really um, Peter Varish and um, um, Steve Chesley have done an independent um, study using the PanStars version of MOPS, uh, where, where they've, they've ran it with uh, 300, square, 300 false positives per square degree, um, and essentially reproduce or, uh, or, or confirm the same thing that we're seeing um, and the same thing really that the know it all uh, saw uh, almost a decade ago or, or predicted almost a decade ago, that this linkage is doable, it will work at these false positive rates um, and that uh, assuming the false positive rates are controlled, uh, MOX should have no problem functioning. And so if you haven't seen uh, Peter and Steve's uh, study, it's been published now um, in uh, this month's um, uh, 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 edition of, of the Astronomical Journal. Um, you can see the link here on, on, this, uh, uh, on this slide and, and go take a look. Uh, and as I said, uh, we're, we're, we're putting in or we're sending, uh, we're responding to reviewer comments on our version of, of a similar study. Um, uh, we're responding to reviewer comments for Icarus, so that should uh, hit the archive uh, soon as, as well. So where do we go beyond this? Um, as, as you may have figured out by you know, the fact that I spent just 20 minutes talking about false positives, that is really what we've been largely focused on over the past uh, two to three years. So we really wanted to make sure we have the image differencing problem under control, that we reduce the false positive rates, and that we're confident that that, that works, because that is really the crucial thing to have under control for, for the MOPS algorithm to work. And I think we're at a point where we are uh, quite confident that that is the case. So going forward, we're now focusing on turning the MOPS prototype that we have into production-ready code. So that includes fixing design issues, improving the algorithm, adding missing pieces, uh, doing a lot of validation. Uh, we have the nominal plan, um, I, I just, we just dug it out out of our uh, project management tool. It's it's uh, it's down there. Uh, it will be significantly refreshed with a lot more details added over the the coming weeks. And on the next slide, and I, I bet that this is what um, I'm, I'm guessing that based on some conversations with Nag, that this is what uh, many of you wanted to, to to get a better sense of. This is how we think MOPS development is going to be um, going on over the, over the next uh, uh, three or four years. So before I start telling you a little bit more about the details, I just want you to, uh, to realize that what I'm showing you here is not final. 
and it's likely to change. We're still tweaking this based on um, some, um, based on the resources that we have and based on uh, the, 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 some test results that we're getting um, uh, actually these days. Um, so some small changes are likely, but this is roughly the general sketch of how we'll develop pops. So for this year, we are, what we're focusing on is taking the prototype we currently have, which is not the easiest piece of software to build, uh, not the easiest piece of software to run, where we want to take that prototype and make sure we can actually uh, run it against some kind of a test suite. So we want both well-defined test data set and performance metrics to be computing. <coughs> and we want to make that easy. So ultimately for, for this uh, year, the, our, our goal is to have that test data set, to have the performance metrics. And every time we make a change to, to the MOPS source code, to have that automatically continuously integrated uh, performance metrics rerun um, and, 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 uh, and an updated uh, report of MOPS performance uh, put out. So anytime you develop this kind of uh, the piece of code with this complexity, you really want to begin with a good test suite so that you know where you are at, every, at any point in development. So that's what we're doing uh, now. Uh, the other thing we're doing is updating this development plan. As I said, we spent uh, most of our time working on image differencing, MOPS was intentionally uh, left for later. Uh, now we're picking up MOPS and we have to take that development plan from the previous slide to, to something at this level. So as I said, this is a draft of, of that uh, MOPS development update or, or summary of that draft. For next year, what we want to do is we want to validate our current MOPS prototype by actually running them on the ZTF alert stream. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in running on real data because that will um, really force you to, to, to face reality and, and uh, deal with all kinds of things that you've forgotten in your simulations. And our goal for next year is to do that with ZTF. For those of you who don't know about ZTF, um, ZTF stands for Zwicky Transit Facility. It's a, a project that's uh, run out of Caltech. Uh, that uh, will be generating um, uh, 1 million uh, alerts per night, or 1 million uh, new discoveries uh, of all kinds of transits, including asteroids, uh, which is uh, which actually approaches LSST data rates. For LSST, we're planning the order of 10 million, so that's that's 10 percent. Um, ZTF is going to be relatively shallow, so it's going to go down to 20.5. Is that right, here? No. So it's going to go down to 20.5. So we don't expect it to be a major um, NEO discovery machine or asteroid discovery machine, but for, for validating MOPS, it will be perfect because one part of ZTF will actually be trying to mimic uh, the LSST cadence. So, so this is, we're having high hopes that this will tell, give us a lot of information on how MOPS will work uh, with, with real LSST. In terms of development, we'll be incorporating uh, initial orbit determination, differential orbit determination. Uh, we're working with, uh, with Steve Chesley and, and company from JPL to bring over some of their code and, and use that uh, at least for, for the beginning. Uh, what I'd like to, to, to understand in 2018 is also to, to, um, to understand how we're going to send all the data that LSST discovers to the MPC. Um, so develop some agreements with the MPC, develop some understanding of, of, of how they receive our data and uh, what, what do we need to do to make it easy for, for them. Um, and one of the big things we want to do is to finalize solar system data products definitions and, and really what I call operational protocols. I'll say a little bit more about that. So these are these questions that you've had in your, uh, in your questions, uh, such as, um, you know, um, is what's written in the DPD the, the final word or is there still a chance to make some changes? And the answer is yes, there is a change. There is still a chance and we want to do that uh, next year. So for 2019, we want to go and improve, start improving on the prototype. In 2019, we get uh, also uh, some more people to work on MOPS. Uh, so we're planning to rewrite the link tracklet stage, incorporate attribution and orbit merging, to rewrite fine tracklets, uh, begin computation of the right quantities, um, such as derivation of absolute magnitudes, albedos, and integration of the overall level one processing system of LSST. That is not just MOPS, but it's um, it's the, the full end-to-end -end system, starting with uh, with uh, imaging and then ending with uh, catalogs of the database. And then when we get to 2020, um, that is that is the period where we where we're on the sky with LSST and commissioning. So we want to validate. We use commissioning camera data, 
add any additional missing pieces, make sure we do uh, our, our link to MPC uh, works well and, and all of that is integrated and then continue doing uh, iterative improvements. So as I said, this here is a, our current draft of the plan. We'll be finalizing this. We, we have a new project manager actually coming in in October. Uh, when, they, when they come in, we'll be finalizing uh, these updates uh, by the end of the year. And then uh, I'm imagining we're going to have, uh, I'll be sending an email to the mailing list giving you an update on this uh, as, as soon as we have this uh, finalized. And this is really roughly the, the sketch of where we're going with the uh, with ops. Okay, um, let me talk a little bit about uh, science expectations. So I'll switch topics a bit and then we can, uh, we can answer questions at, at, for, for all these at the end. Um, what LSST is going to deliver, uh, I think you've probably seen this slide a number of times already, are three levels of data products, level one, level two, and level three. Uh, level one are things that, that happen on a nightly cadence, and this includes the catalog of orbits. So we'll be sending, at the end of every night, we'll be generating a new catalog of asteroids discovered uh, by LSST. <coughs> and level two includes data releases. So this is, these are the results. This is the result of reprocessing all of LSST data uh, approximately once every year. Um, first, for first year of data, we expect it twice. So for LSS, for the solar system, I think this is a more useful slide. Uh, this is what we should expect for the solar system. So, and I've I've uh, I've sorted it by cadence, sort of, or by by the, the, the time interval. So within 60 seconds of each observation. We're going to send out a, a real-time stream of, of observation alerts, of event alerts, with information about anything that's changed in the sky. So for asteroids, uh, this will uh, be mostly interesting. I think for asteroids, the most interesting thing for asteroids here is going to be uh, in case of trailed objects. Um, if you have a trailed object, it's virtually guaranteed to be an asteroid uh, or, uh, or a satellite. And in that case, the trails will be really long um, or near. Um, so and then and you, can, you can try to distinguish between um, all of those uh, based on the properties of the trail. That information is going to become available within 60 seconds. So within 60 seconds, we'll send out an alert uh, saying there's, a, there's an object there. It's PSF magnitude is as follows. It's it's uh, we fit the trail source of model to it, and the trail and it seems like it's a trail, and it it's extended in this direction, and it moves with falling velocity. That kind of thing becomes available uh, essentially immediately. Then every day at the end of the night, uh, what we do is uh, most asteroids are actually not going to be trailed. They're going to look just like stars, so they'll be difficult to pick out. Or new discoveries will be difficult to pick out. Uh, from the, the, the real-time alert streams. So at the end of each day, we'll be running MOPs. We'll be linking uh, those tracklets into tracks. And any new tracks that are identified um, as positive linkages uh, by the end of that, uh, that, that day or based on the observations of the previous night uh, will be both reported to the Minor Planet Center um, and also placed into the catalog of, of orbits for LSST discovered objects. So at the end of the day, we publish a, a new catalog or an updated catalog, um, and we also send that information uh, with the observations to, to the MPC. And then every year, <coughs> we essentially repeat what we do on a daily basis in the annual um, data release. But in this case, <laughs> the photometry and the astrometry that will be used to generate that, uh, to, to create that catalog, the catalog that will produce the data release, are going to be more precise than the photometry and astrometry that we have available at the end of each night. And therefore, that catalog will be, uh, should be more precise than, than what you get on a nightly basis. Um, this has uh, all kinds of, of interesting implications there or interesting questions about um, how do we do this operationally. So for example, when we update essentially all of our photometry every year, how do we send that information back to the Minor Planet Center? Or when we update all of our astrometry, you know, how do we send information for, uh, for what will be billions of astrometric measurements at the MPC? Uh, those kinds of things are things that I'd like to, 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 to begin discussing and start understanding uh, with, with Matt and the company uh, over the next year or so. Um, 
solar system science goals. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll, I'm going to skip this um, discussing this slide in details, except to tell you that it's available. Um, look at ls.st slash xcv. Uh, this is what we're trying to achieve, or th these are the goals that LSSD is trying to achieve. So when you when you think about what will LSSD discover in terms of fractions of populations, we're not going to 100%, our, our requirements are not to go at 100% anywhere. Uh, they're on order of 80 to 90%. Our, our guiding requirement really is to enable science. Um, and for science, uh, the difference between 80 and 90% may, may not be that huge. The reason why I mentioned this is that uh, this is somewhat in tension with uh, the, the if requirements for planetary defense, where the difference between 80 and 90% is a factor of two in the number of, of yet still unknown objects that, uh, that may come after you. Um, but we, we have these requirements uh, there in the document that's, uh, that's linked. Uh, they're in the draft, still a draft, unfortunately, document that's uh, it's linked uh, on, on this slide. Our uh, current uh, simulations, our current cadence simulations, show that we generally meet these, uh, assuming we have MOPS running. So and then again, as I said, you know, MOPS is very much dependent on, uh, on image differencing. So that's why we spend so much time on image differencing. So we expect we'll do well. In, in most of these cases, we're actually doing better than the requirement. So um, uh, you can you can take a look at, at this. It's a table. Um, uh, what is it? Table 3.2 in the LSD observing strategy white paper. In terms of the actual absolute numbers, um, this is the kind of thing you should be uh, looking forward to. <laughs> so an order of six million asteroids uh, in the main belt. 40,000 uh, TNOs, um, uh, 300,000 Jupiter Trojans, and an order of 100,000 uh, NEOs. Uh, those are those are the kinds of numbers that our simulations are. Uh, the simulation, the current simulation, is showing that, that we should yield. Now, um, final two slides of, of this section. Um, one of the questions that frequently get that I, that I get asked frequently is. Okay, you're going to discover all these asteroids. What are you actually going to give us for, for each and every one of them? And uh, so what kind of data is going to be published? Um, so the, the, the data products for the solar system, um, we have defined them a few years ago in a document called the, the Data Products Definition Document. It's on uh, this link, so ls.st slash uh, LSC-163, or actually, if you go to ls.st slash dpdd, that will work as well. Uh, and what that document does is it lays out a concept of what will be uh, delivered to enable solar system science. So the major catalog here is really uh, the, the catalog of orbits, um, of, of, of orbits that we derived from, from uh, measurements that, uh, that LSC took. And what I have here is a screenshot from the DPDD uh, of the SS object table uh, in the database, which is essentially that catalog of orbits. So you, you see the, uh, the, the typical thing you would expect to find in, uh, in an orbit catalog, say, such as asteroid or, um, or the MPC catalog. Um, and then if I go on to the next slide, you see, you see more of that. Um, for each of those, or alongside each of those orbits, we will also have individual observations. So um, you will be able to, um, uh, each asteroid is going to be observed uh, on order of 100 times. So for, for each asteroid, you'll be able to go and, and, and get the actual uh, photometry and astrometry uh, that was used to, to derive these quantities in the orbit uh, catalog, um, do things like compute colors, uh, et cetera. This is all we have at the moment uh, as far as the definition of solar system products goes. The reason why in the previous slide I said that this is a solar system object catalog concept is that there are, you know, if you look at the text, um, there's, there's a lot of equivocation here uh, in, in various uh, parts. So, you know, we may decide not to fit for it all over the first few data releases. Uh, alternatively, we may fit using strong priors uh, or the LSST database will provide um, functions to compute um, phase angles, um, as well as um, the reduced bands. I think there's even a footnote that says, you know, we're, we'll compute other quote unquote useful quantities. Um, 
these were the things that in 2013, when we wrote these documents, it, it didn't make much sense to actually write out all of them, write out every single thing we're going to do. But now I think is the time to, to actually nail that down and say, what are the derived quantities that, uh, that uh, LST should deliver uh, versus uh, what are the things that, uh, that uh, the community will have to take up? And so this, for me, is one of our major goals for, for 2018. By the end, I want to have an updated definition of the solar system data products so of this table, of this chapter in, in the BBDD, um, in a really good scheme of what is it that, that we need to deliver in the same time frame uh, to, to understand better these operational details. So connection to MPC, how we exchange information with MPC, how do we do attribution of known ob object observations and, and things of that sort. So I think this is something where I will ask for, for the collaborations help, obviously, uh, because this is uh, what, we're, what we're trying to do here is to come up with something that we can produce on, on the LSSD, on the project side, on the facility side, but that will be useful to, to the collaboration. So we want to make sure that that we we uh, we have everything there that uh, uh, that that you may need yet that that we can actually sign up to deliver, um, uh, just given our, our budget and schedule. So that's that's just a, a a hint about something about a process that we hope to start uh, next week actually at the all hands meeting in the Thursday session, and then uh, run it uh, through 2018. And by by the 2018 all hands. By 2018 LSST uh, uh, meeting uh, to, to have this uh, really hammered out. So um, the the last couple of slides I have are, are on the questions that you sent me via email and uh, or through that uh, through Google Doc. And so we have about 10 minutes left. So I'll try to go fairly quickly through those, and then let's let's take uh, questions that have uh, arrived. Uh, in, well, as I was speaking, or or any clarifications uh, that that you may may want. <laughs> so what I tried to do here is to to group the questions and so, somewhat rephrase them in some cases. Um, uh, naturally, group the questions and rephrase them occasionally. So uh, two questions were really there was a group of questions about cadence. Um, so one question was, uh, what about uh, twilight? Um, what about objects detectable during dawn or twilight hours? <laughs> Will there be data from these? Uh, our current baseline cadence does not include twilight, but cadences including twilight are scheduled to be simulated by the end of this year. So by the end of this year, assuming uh, OPSIM B4, our tool for making these simulations is accepted and on schedule and validated, uh, we should have twilight simulations uh, for, for the community to look at. Uh, and then if those turn out to be uh, useful, then uh, the, the uh, uh, they may be offered to the, to the science advisory committee to make a recommendation for the final cadence. That brings me to the second question. Um, how can discovery of outer solar system objects affected by cadence uh, decisions and how is their scientific importance included in the calculus for determining the final cadence? So basically, the question here is how will LSST determine the final cadence? Um, the, the process that we've established and that, that Joko Ivozic is actually running is that um, the, the community, what we're asking the community to do right now is to propose metrics. Um, I say steward strategies, but it's mostly metrics by which the science returns can be quantified. So if you have something that you want to do, for example, with the outer solar system, please give us a metric that can quantify how well a certain cadence will achieve that. So if I give you a list of, of observations um, uh, over 10 years, um, compute some kind of metric on those observations to give us a quantitative sense of whether it's good or not good for that science case. Once we, as we receive those metrics, the project will then execute a suite of simulations attempt, att attempting to optimize for those numbers. So attempting to find simulations that, that maximize as many of these metrics as possible. And what the project is going to do at the end of that, uh, of that process is <coughs> we'll make a, a recommendation on, on which suite of strategies or, or to, to, to select from really to the Science Advisory Committee. Science Advisory Committee is an independent body of, of, uh, of, of scientists from, from the community who will make that, that final uh, choice of the recommendation. 
how will they weigh different uh, areas of science? That's something that has not yet been defined, um, but there, are, there is a presentation from the civil system on that committee. I believe that uh, Amy Meiser is, uh, is the representative uh, and they will be making uh, this, this final recommendation to the project on, on which strategy to adopt. This is still, that final recommendation obviously is still in the future, but the, the collection of metrics and the execution of these simulations that, that uh, attempt to optimize these metrics, that's very much in process right now. So do take a look at these two links that I, uh, that I put out, uh, that I added down here. So the case optimization presentation um, that uh, Jelko did a couple of uh, months ago for the science collaboration chairs and the observing strategy uh, white paper. Now, uh, catalog, there were a number of questions about the catalog. What will be in the catalog? Can we still uh, change what's going to be measured? Uh, the answer is yes, as I mentioned. I think we, we have the, the general outlines. I don't think that anything dramatic will change there, but questions such as, you know, should we use this photometric system uh, uh, for, say, age in G1 and G2 or that? Uh, those are the kind of questions that, or, or something else, those are the kinds of questions that I want to that, that we'll, uh, we'll discuss uh, over the next year and we'll, we'll uh, understand you. Um, uh, um, so, uh, section of the community, uh, and that's why we kind of stop at the orbit catalog. Mm -hmm. we, we try not to do uh, things that are that are, uh, as I say, where there's more than one way to do it, or, or where there's controversy on what the best way to do it is. That, that we consider is a research project for the community. Uh, how can one contribute code? Yes, we definitely prefer co collaboration. Um, all our code is on GitHub. Mops right now is not something I would advise uh, folks actually try to, to, to build and, and run, but uh, this should get better in about six months or so. And I think that's the, the right time to, to get back to this question. Um, what's currently planned, we, we discussed that a little bit. This is the, uh, this is that, the slide that I showed you. Um, will we distribute links to known objects earlier in the night? The answer is yes. I think we'll, within 60 seconds here, we will distribute, we'll already link to known objects. So if one of these is a known asteroids, it will be, a, Part of the alert will be its identification, so, so we'll get that information. And will we do force photometry of solar system objects? The answer is, is no. So we will, will not be uh, predicting where they are uh, along the orbit and, uh, and running force photometry there. Uh, this is something that, the, that the, someone in the science collaboration can do on their own because we will have a cutout service that will serve you the, uh, uh, the, the images on which you can do full force photometry. Um, <clears throat> And the, the final slide was about what I'm calling, what I would say, what I would call management. So what are our plan, plans and timelines for testing and commissioning MOPS? Uh, so I, I had that on one of the previous slides. And to me, the most important uh, thing right now is to get it tested on ZTF and to get playing on ZTF. I think if we, if we manage to do that by the end of next year, uh, that will be a major milestone, and uh, you know, at that point, it's uh, it's all improving and just making sure that we can scale to to the level of LSST. Uh, how should uh, the the collaboration contribute to commissioning of MOPS? Um, we and how, or and also to development of the code. I think in the near term, uh, and I'm defining that as the next you know, six to nine months. I think. But the, the onus is on us to really clean up our code first uh, before we can ask for, for your help or contribution. But uh, starting in 2018, um, there'll be opportunities to develop test data sets, to add to MOPS validation suite, perhaps running MOPS on your data. I think that'll be very interesting. We'll definitely be trying to run it on ZT, trying to run it on ZTF, but MOPS is agnostic of what serve, which server it's running on. As, as, as long as you have the right cadence, it can do it. And then uh, provide feedback, you know, explore. Uh, one of the big things you can do is, is uh, explore, demonstrate, and contribute al alternative algorithms if, uh, if that's uh, what your research is. And uh, what is the level of commitment by the project to deliver uh, solar system object science? Um, I, I realize there's been a lot of concern because you know, we've delayed MOPS, uh, like full-fledged MOPS development uh, all the way until now. We, we developed prototypes back in 2013, but we haven't done much with them until now. But 
the, the reason for that is that we really, really believe that that our that we have to get the image of this right. And that's what we've been doing uh, to enable models. Solar system science does continue to be one of the four key areas we're required to deliver on in our top level science requirements document. And uh, we're going to do that. So I think those are uh, all the questions I got. I may have skipped one. I, I remember there was something about uh, um, centrating on comments that I don't remember answering, but uh, ask me that again. If I, if I skipped it, I apologize. Um, the last thing I want to say is communications. Uh, I'd like us to really start uh, communicating better because we'll, we'll want feedback on definition of sources and data products, operational ideas, et cetera. Uh, I will, you know, we, within the project, we want to stay up to date with what the collaboration is planning. So to make sure that we're delivering the right um, set of data and tools uh, that, that uh, you will be using for, for the science. And so one of the things that we want to do is, is to have more frequent meetings like this, I think, um, perhaps have a quarterly status meeting. Uh, we, we want to keep you up to date with what we're doing and want to have that, uh, that feedback. Uh, and also we'll always be at DPS meetings uh, and uh, at the LSST meetings. So, all right, this is our communityLSST.org is the place to, uh, to go and ask questions. Um, uh, it, it's probably better than directly emailing me or, or, or anyone because more people see it. And I will stop there. Uh, I'll leave the summary up here. So thank you. Thanks very much. So I'll just give a couple of things I think um, that came out of our sort of working group leads discussion as well that I think paired to this. So one, um, let me just say also we have, and someone's clapping, thanks, in the chat box. Um, Renu Maholtra is also on the on the Science Advisory Council. So we have two people uh, that are our representatives, so Amesy Manzer and Renu. So Renu will be at the LSST 2017 meeting, so you can hunt her down and talk to her more if you're about cadence and anything else. Um, we are also going to have a science roadmap. Um, we are restarting that effort. So you'll hear more from the working group leads about that individually, but the idea we have is that to have something in six months where we have both our science cases that we think are priority <laughs> and those sort of requirements or sort of metrics for the cadence to say whether or not it's checking off that box. So that's kind of what we're thinking for in sort of the next six months. So I think that pairs well with everything you're talking about with MOPS development. So um, people in the rest of the SSE doesn't quite know that yet because it's going to be in the update and you'll slowly start hearing from your working group leads since we just met a week or so ago. Um, the other thing is there will be a meeting at DPS. It's not on the schedule. They're working on figuring out why they didn't put it in, but we will have a workshop at um, one of the days during uh, DPS. Um, for the SSC, and so I think someone from the project team is coming out for that. So um, just to give everyone that update. So um, I think with all that rambling, we can get on to questions. Um, so one we have is from Julio is uh, or Julio. Some solar system objects will be backgrounded by the galactic plane, so that their astrometry may be difficult. Do you have any plan or special solutions for to flag you know things like that that are in the galaxy? Um, when sort of identifying them or uh, getting their astrometry. Yeah, so so we will have, um, we are, we're currently trying to understand how well our image differencing is going to, to work in the plane. Our, our requirements are, are fairly stringent on it uh, because there are many other, uh, in addition to the solar system, there are, uh, there's galactic science to be done there. Uh, so I don't have, an actual number to give you, you know, how, how good astrometry is going to be in the galactic plane or how good photometry is going to be in the galactic plane, but it is part of, of the overall um, level one package that, that we're able to do astronomy and photometry. Um, and then we, we treat those objects uh, just like, uh, like uh, all the others that, that we detect. If there's um, lack of confidence or if, there's a, if, if there are potential issues with an object due to uh, crowding or Whatever it is, it will be flagged appropriately. Uh, so, so that is necessary. Not not only that that's that's a generic property of, of how we put together pipelines. So, you will be, for example, you will it will be possible to 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 pick out to, to filter out all the objects that have um, uh, flags that that indicate that astrometry is potentially iffy from your uh, if you're if you're trying to recompute an orbit solution. From, from the from the asteroids that uh, from the asteroid measurements that we got, but that's kind of the level at which um, 
I can uh, describe it right now. Um, we've got one from David Gerdes. What's the minimum velocity of a moving object that MOPS can detect? For example, what if a distant <laughs> object is moving too slowly to produce a resolved pattern and exposures that are 30 minutes apart? Yeah. We, we haven't looked in detail about the minimum velocity. We're more worried about the maximum, but, but that's essentially what defines the, the, the minimum. If we cannot create that tracklet, then we're going to lose it. Um, and so it's it's 30 minutes apart, um, and uh, I actually don't have the number in my head um, you know, what what the motion uh, needs to be to 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 make it uh, less than a PSF distance effectively. Um, so how do, how is MOPS going to deal with faint fuzzy things, i.e., comets? <laughs> um, it will treat them just like everything else. Um, so it will, uh, we will be computing centroids and I, I put up the, I, I remember which slide I skipped, I skipped the algorithm slides. Uh, I'm sorry about that. So that's why I put it up here so you can read the, read the answers to, to, to those questions. Um, it will, um, it will use the same centroiding algorithm we, we use everywhere. So in the case of fuzzy objects, uh, it will um, give us the centroid of, of the peak. Uh, it's, I'm oversimplifying it a little bit. Uh, and that will go into the bin uh, when we compute orbits. So given that the object is fuzzy, that's probably not going to be the optimal uh, solution. And, but what you will be able to do is we will tell you that the object is fuzzy. Um, if, if we can uh, distinguish, I mean, we can, we can tell whether we're going to be computing a, a few different models. So PSF model, trail source model, we're going to be computing things like um, uh, what is it? Uh, moments, second order moments on, on every footprint of every object. So there's enough information in the data stream to tell you this object is not consistent with a point source. We'll be able to pick those objects out and then try to attempt to do better centroiding, knowing now that this is a fuzzy object and computing better orbits or whatever it is they're trying to do. But we will, we don't plan at the moment to, to spend uh, uh, a lot of time de developing uh, specific codes to, to take care of it at that level. Um, we have, from your slide nine, it's not clear to me whether objects will be imaged in different filters within, say, an hour. So are those tracklets possibly going to be different filters um, you're using for detection? Yes, that's, that's possible, right? We, we, don't have that. we don't have a constraint on, on uh, the filter being the same. That's true. Um, from West typically, Frazier, how typically, do... typically the case, I'm sorry, uh, typically it will be the case, but I, I don't think there's a, there's a constraint. Yeah. But that's something that we could put in or as a metric to see if we really believe that that's something that's going to hurt us, but how different the filters are, for example. Correct. Okay. Um, so Wes says, how will MOPS feed into um, other directly measurables, photometry, for example? Um, so we, we, with MOPS, we primarily, uh, the idea is to primarily to link observations and then when we compute the orbit um, and based on on the photometry uh, based on the photometric measurements at, at, at each point along the orbit and you know, the phase angle and everything we'll try to we'll derive with a yet tbd algorithm the the absolute magnitude the i'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm trying to make sure i'm answering the right question tell me if, I, if, I, if i'm not uh, but if you're if you're asking about the individual photometry for for every every point um, uh, every observation, that's going to be done the same way we do uh, photometry for, for all the other objects of the image. So it's a, it's a suite of measurements. So you, you're going to get a PSF photometry, you're going to get a trail source fit, um, you're going to get aperture photometry, multiple apertures. So um, I think related to that is you talk a lot about the solstice of definition products sort of listed in table four. Is there any chance that's going to be possibly reduced? We talked about it being altered and maybe changed and things added, but is that the, like the minimum we are guaranteed to get? Or is there a chance that that could be reduced later on given other constraints and things that pop up in development? So, so our, I, I think um, we consider this the, what we need to deliver. And the, the way I, I see this getting reduced, there are two ways I see this getting reduced. One is um, the, the collaboration tells me this particular thing is completely useless and you know you should spend your time doing something computing something different 
you know, and, and that would actually be quite useful for me if, if there's a piece that we're trying to plan to deliver right now that, that actually isn't going to be interesting, uh, now, now's the time to tell us. Uh, the, the other example is the more catastrophic one uh, where uh, you know, that's valid across all areas size analysis. See if, if something catastrophic happens with the telescope. Um, I don't know, we break the secondary, we need to downsize on everything. Um, that hopefully is unlikely as well. So, so you, yes, you should consider this a minimum um, modulo, the, the fact that you know, if, if there's some gross mistake we've made in saying we're going to compute this and you think we shouldn't do that, uh, that that's how I see downsizing. All right. Um, so one thing, I guess, um, and this is my question, everything's sort of going to the MPC in some form quickly um, in a day. So in essence, detections are, are there. So interesting odd objects are possible to be sifted out of the MPC from people who don't have data rights. Um, so what's the benefit do you see sort of being, you know, having uh, someone who's a data rights person for um, what act, what's a benefit for us of being solicitum astronomers? Is it just the access to the imaging and being able to do follow-up astron astrometry or photometry on those once we have detections from MOPS? Just so great to hear sort of what the project team sort of thinks the benefits are of being a sort of data right solicit astronomer, given we're sort of everything will be quickly going to the MPC, um, or at least initial detections go to the MPC pretty quickly. So, so um, that, that's a good question. I mean, I haven't really, I haven't thought about it, to be honest, but from that perspective, but just you know, off the top of my head, I think one big advantage is going to be uh, that you will have access to the data access center and all the services that the data access center has. So if you say want to do force photometry over kind of a single object or, or 10,000 objects, you'll be able to log on to data process to the data access center and do that. Um, someone who doesn't have data rights won't be able to do that. Um, if you, uh, the, 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 uh, there are other other things at, at, at the DAX that uh, that will be useful. Um, there's going to be this Jupiter Lab environment that'll be they'll be up there that will allow you to do um, analyses on LSSD data products uh, right then and there quickly. Um, data access, the, the the data releases are also going to be available to data rights holder only. So the improved photometry, the best photometry that we have, and the best astronomy that we have, um, and these are the operational details that we have to work out with the MPC, as I said, uh, are going to initially be available only to the data rights holders. Uh, so I, I, I bet if I thought about it a little bit more, I'd come up with a bigger list, but you know, to, to me, just the, the ability to um, let's say you know you, you identify an interesting thing at the end of the night, and then you want to go and say do force photometry, or or you want to go and detect a three sigma in this area of sky where you suspect that object may have been, uh, if it's say interesting, uh, that you will be able to do only if you have uh, data rights access or data rights. Thanks. Um, so there's a question from Kwanzi about a. Uh... How is MOPS going to deal with trailed any NEOs um, that show coverage within the three-day cadence? Is that something you you guys have started to think about? Yeah. So so I had uh, where is it? Um, so I had that question, and the answer is we are we're assuming. Um, so where is it? Trail, trail, trail. Here we go. So. Um, the, the way I interpreted this question was, what happens if the trail itself is not linear? So if the trail itself is linear, then I, I, I think we're fine. Um, and we are already assuming, MOPS already deals with objects that have appreciable curvature over the 14-day period. But what happens if the trail itself shows nonlinear motion? Um, in this case, um, the answer is uh, we're, we're not planning to do anything special there. We'll only be planning to, we'll only be fitting linear trail models. Uh, what you will be able to do is uh, based on the information we give you, the fit to the, for that model will, will have a not so great chi-square. So you'll be able to select those objects out of the data stream uh, based on the fact that they're trailed and that they seem to show curvature by not being a good fit to, to just a linear, linear model. And then uh, downstream, you can do additional processing. Uh, so th that's currently what we're planning. We don't plan to do anything uh, special on, on the project side. I think um, what feeds into that. Um, so 
my, and this is one of my questions. Mops is um, sort of one of the, this version of Mops is one of the few that will actually have to be, you know, end to end sort of automated detection. And almost every um, solar system sort of object detection pipeline has it had human review at the end. Um, and so it's great that we see a, there's going to be lots of, you know, you're predicting to be the very low false positives and I believe them, but I also worry about what could be missed as well. Um, is there, are you guys planning to try to do any sort of comparison with a, with, you know, uh, commissioning CAM data for comparing sort of a human review of a small subset to what the full MOPS pipeline is by finding or reviewing of those output just to see that we're, we've got that sanity check. Um, I was just wondering if that's something sort of being thought about. Yeah. So, so right now we're, we're not planning any um, active kind of day-to-day -day human involvement. I mean, we, we, are, we will be, we will have uh, folks looking at that at you know, just some statistics computed over the orbit catalog. So, so we know that things have not gone haywire, but the assumption is that, um, and this is general philosophy of the LCT as a facility, you know, we will do some basic level of, of QAing and then beyond that, um, we, we want to make sure that, that we're confident that the, the product is good enough to warrant your attention. But if, if we have issues at a level of, um, you know, one in 10,000, then, then that may be something that uh, the community helps us identify and, and fix for the next data release. So I, I think it, it's just a matter of resources. We, we won't be able to have um, to, to have that level of validation on, on the project side of the operation. But, but I think it's a, it's a very, very good question. And that's why I'd like to have it running on ZTF, because if we have it running on ZTF, and ZTF is trying to emulate LSST cadence, it will tell us a lot about what the LSST orbit catalog is going to look like. You know, how many short arc objects are we going to have? Um, th those kinds of things. So that's that's the thing that, that personally interests me the most. How, to, to how many of these objects we're going to have to attach a probability of this even being real? Thanks. Um, and I think we'll just end with um, sort of a, uh, Darren has a couple questions, but I'm going to pick one of them just for time since we're, we're already over. Um, so what's a, signal, a single image um, signal to noise threshold for something to make it into a tracklet? So is it a signal noise of five for both images? And, and sort of how does that fold into the fact that you're using multiple filters and objects of different colors and different filters? <laughs> so it's, single, it's a signal to noise of five um, in each visit. So um, I just want to make, make sure that I'm clear there because our, our, our actual exposures are two 15 second exposures back to back that we then co add. And for all practical uh, purposes, it's actually a 30 second effective exposure. So in that 30 second exposure, we do a signal to noise five cut. And then the next one, 30 minutes later, the same thing signal to noise of five cut, irrespective of the filter. And then those are the, the two objects that go into uh, into considerations for making a track All right. So I think with that, um, we've sort of already gone over in time. So I just want to say thank you, Mario. And if we have other questions, you know, you can shoot them to me, and I can um, sort of ask at the LSST 2017 meeting. We are going to try to stream the the solar system session, but if not, I'll sort of live tweet it from from Slack. So there'll be there'll be a sort of stream or way you can contribute. So um, thanks very much, Mario, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. And if there if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to follow up uh, by by just posting a question on community, and and we'll uh, we'll try to answer that as as soon as uh, as we can. All right, and I'll try to get the recordings um, and slides out um, in the next day or so. So thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks. thanks.